All right, welcome back to the Plenary Session Podcast. I'm joined by my good friend and colleague, Dr. John Mandrola. It's just the two of us this week. Who knows what happened? Just the two of us. Dr. John, it's a pleasure to see you. Ah, thanks, thanks. Uh, happy Easter to you. Happy Easter to you, sir. And um, and cheers to that. I see you had a glass of red wine, so cheers to that. Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, I just want to say to everybody in Louisville, Kentucky, it's one of these glorious spring days. The azaleas are blooming at 70 degrees. It's just, just gorgeous here. So You got your tank top on. You've been out there exercising. It's a nice yeah, yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice ride on a Pinarillo, and it was beautiful. <laughs> great, great. And you're going to Europe soon. You're back in Portugal. Is that right, Dr. John? Give some Portuguese talks. Cardi the Portuguese Cardiac Society invited me, and I'm so grateful to go. I went there pre-pandemic, and it's really a beautiful meeting. That's going to be one of our topics. So we're going to talk about something Dr. John read recently. We're going to talk about what everyone wants to talk about, the Texas ruling of mifepristone, which is a drug that's used for abortion. And then we're going to talk about therapeutic fashion, randomized control trials, why, why doctors do what they do. So let's kick it off. Dr. John, you were reading something recently. You enjoyed okay. it. What was this article? Yeah, I mean, uh, Sensible Medicine Post, a medical student, Dave the Knave, comes up with this critical appraisal of the recent RSV uh, vaccine trial. And, you know, I, I saw that on Wednesday and, you know, this is really a novel topic and it was kind of out of my, uh, out of my wheelhouse of expertise. And then, and I'm like, I really need an explainer on this. And all of a sudden sensible medicine just post, I mean, we just get this beautiful post from Dave. I mean, it was well-written, concise, impartial, um, and and really, uh, it's it just. I asked you, you know, is 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 this guy like, is he like an epidemiologist that went to medical school? <laughs> he's like uh, he's like a future Doctor John, I think. Yeah. So oh. Dave Dave Alelli, medical student out there in Mount Sinai, I believe he's in New York City, and um, he has a great post. So funny because I was actually thinking about. I got somebody's got to read all these articles and make sense of it for sensible medicine. I was about to do it. I opened my inbox and Dave has this article says, you know, would you consider this for sensible medicine? I read it. I was like blew, blown away. It said everything what I wanted it to say. So he's a medical student. He's terrific. He's written a couple of things for us. I think now people can go back and pull him. Um, he approaches all issues, I think, pretty neutrally, wants to try to figure out evidence based medicine. He goes through the efficacy and the safety of this maternal RSV vaccine. These are mRNA, mRNA vaccines for respiratory syncytial virus given to the pregnant mother um, in the hopes that it will improve outcomes for the child as well. And indeed, in these two studies in the New England Journal this week, they do find that that's the case. Dave has been closely following this field, so he knows that a prior company, I believe it was GlaxoSmithKline, they had a mRNA vaccine, they had, sorry, they had a vaccine against RSV but they were thwarted by the safety signal of low birth weights among the babies. So that was the safety signal. The pregnant women would get it and they'd have low birth weight babies. And that was thought to be cause to abandon the program. So Dave, with that background knowledge, he approaches this issue and he asks, what do we know about the birth weight? And indeed it was either one pound or one kilogram. I, I think one kilogram lower. Uh, I have to double check one pound or one kilogram, but it was, uh, it was lower uh, uh, among the group that got the vaccine. Was it statistically significant? I don't know. I don't think they put a p-value there. I don't think they analyzed it in that way. But Dave's point is that he wants to see more data to kind of make sense of this risk-benefit balance. Um, I thought it was a good point. And I think a lot of other people thought it was a good point as well. He's a good student. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, I I would encourage everybody to, to, to read his post. I mean, he goes into... I mean, a little brief background for people beforehand, and then, you know, ask, uh, before reading a study, it is helpful to ask yourself, yourself what questions you want answered. I like to break them down in respect to efficacy, effectiveness, and safety. And those words sound, the, efficacy and effectiveness sound the same, right? But it's different because mm -hmm. efficacy is, you know, how well the thing works in a clinical trial. Yes. which is which is special because they select special patients patients you know they can do it they have research you know that the trial environments different research nurses and so does it work under those circumstances and that's different than effectiveness which is 
how an intervention works in real world conditions. Like, how is it going to work in your patient, in your clinic? And then, you know, he goes, he goes through these things. And I, 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 I was really impressed. I was really um, impressed. The I other did, thing, yeah. the other thing that I, I, I really think is a teaching point, And I, I think I'm going to harp on this in future posts is this whole Y axis problem, right? Yes. All, yes. Not uh, in this study, but also just Y axis on all these things you would see during the pandemic. People would post things with Y axis that, you know, it, it just really is important to look at the Y axis. And here, you know, the, I don't know why New England allowed this, but the, the, the drug efficacy is posted with a zero to three. Right. Percentage. Percent in, and that's exploded. That's exploded on the figure. Right. Of course it would be zero to 3% is going to, you could have a 1% difference and it's going to look huge. And then for, you know what? I'm going to share my screen here so people can see it. So yeah. what they what you were looking at, if you were watching at home, I think I pull this off. You're seeing, as do, as John is saying, that the F, the the Y axis here is blown the hell up for you know this little break between three percent and a hundred percent. That means most of it is white. So they show you the difference really big. But then I think Dave's point in the essay was, but for safety events, they don't do that. They don't blow it the way the hell up. They make it all flat on the axis to sort of hair, hide the safety. What a double standard. I mean, look, you could argue it both ways that you don't get to appreciate the difference unless you blow it up, but then why doesn't that a actually apply to the safety as well? He's really got him. He's got him in a great sort of paradox, right? Yeah, and, and I think that I think this is I think this is really important because you, you know, reader re listeners and readers might just think, oh, this is semantics or whatever. But I mean that 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 curve that picture is going to be shown, you know, all over the internet. And it's, it's really deceptive. And I think that, you know, trials, trials in cardiology have, have done similar things where, you know, they'll, they'll have a Kaplan-Meier curve and then the insert will be on a smaller Y scale and you'll see the curves separate. But when you look at it on a hundred scale, hundred percent, it's not much difference. The other thing that Vinay, that I think that they do a lot. And I, I think that Dave pointed out here is, they will tell you the relative, they will tell you the efficacy in relative risk. This reduced the risk of the event by 20%, but then they'll tell you the they'll tell you the complications or adverse events in absolute risk, which absolute <laughs> risk is 0.2%. Right. And right. it's not fair. And and it just gets to this just gets to the adjudication of, of evidence and science and I don't know. I, I hope that one of the roles of sensible medicine and, and our substacks is that we will we will be impartial judges and we will point these things out. And and, and I, I don't know what's going on at New England. And New England isn't the only one. I mean, this happens in Lancet. It happens in Jack. It happens in JAMA. Uh, and, and I don't understand that it's not right and it's not fair, in my opinion. Yeah, they just need some standardized ways of reporting benefit and risk in a fair way. As you say, if you're going to break the y-axis for one, break it for both. And if you're going to report one in relative risk, report it for both. But to have absolute risk for the harms and the big 100% y-axis for the harms, but for the benefits, break the axis and have relative benefits, that is really a double standard. Now, the one thing I would have to say is I have to correct myself. Previously, I was talking about birth weight. They, it, the paper didn't report birth weight. They reported the percent of women who had preterm births, and that's a 1% absolute risk. I was wrong about that. Sorry. Uh, remembering too many things at once. So 1% absolute risk of preterm births from like 4.5 to 5.5-ish. But that's that's what Dave's pointing out. He's he's worried about that. He's right to be worried. Um, one more thing, John. Yeah. The can, other I, thing, can, I can say go, this. Okay, you can no, you go, say go, you go. You have another thing, but go ahead. I have one more too. Okay. Well, my point, you don't have to react to this. I'll take the blame for this. Uh Eric Topol has a post about these mRNA studies, and Dave Alelli has a post of these mRNA studies. One is the director of an institute at Scripps La Jolla, one is a medical student. And there's no question about it. Dave's post is much more accurate, informative, and critical than Eric's post, which is really like cheerleading for this giving no specific details, not talking about the safety signal concerns at all. <laughs> Just because to show you, I think this guy doesn't know what he's doing. By that, I mean Topol. Okay, John, your point, your last point? Well, 
you know, I, I I didn't read I didn't read Eric's Eric's piece, um, so I, I I can't comment on that. But the other no, the other thing I would point out, and this gets to our our arguments with screening, and it, it gets to it, it it gets to this whole um, uh, treatment specific um, outcome versus all cause, and and right. you know, did the vaccine? I mean, do 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 moms and infants, do, do parents of infants really care about, you know, one kind of upper respiratory tract infection? Yes, RSV is an important respiratory pathogen, but there are other respiratory pathogens. And so, you know, this treatment prevents one, uh, it purportedly, or putatively report, re, prevents one type of infection, but there are many different kinds of respiratory infections. And so it, it, it gets to screening for one type of disease. It gets to, in cardiology, we have these things called heart failure hospitalizations. A drug may prevent heart failure hospitalizations, but that's only a fraction of total hospitalizations. And so, you know, that I think that's, you know, Dave's point about adverse effects, they, they, they you know, it didn't look like it was that terrible, but any small signal of adverse effects when you're only moving one Treatment specific endpoint, I think, is an important consideration in critical appraisal. Let me read two quotes about this. One, Dave Alelli writes, quote, all cause hospitalizations, because ultimately the reason you're doing anything is you want to lower the chance that the child has hospitalized for any reason. We think RSV is an important contributor of that. If we lower that, there'll be a reduction in both RSV related hospitalization and all cause hospitalization. Quote, there are there is no data provided regarding all cause hospitalizations which is concerning given the results of all cause lower respiratory tract infection, which he details below, quote, all cause lower respiratory tract infection, there was unambiguously zero effect on all cause lower respiratory tract infection. So Dave's point is, if you're a parent, what you really care about is you don't care about what are the initials the doctor is going to tell you when your kid has a virus. Is it RSV or COVID or, you know, whatever it is. You don't care about the letters. You care about just how many times is my baby going to the hospital and how many times is my baby sick? And his point is that there's no reduction in lower respiratory tract tech infections of whatever the cause is. And you're not even telling me about all cause hospitalizations. And I think this is exactly the point that you're making, John, from cardiology to cancer screening to infectious disease. We, we need to improve the clinical outcome, which in influenza, we call it influenza-like illness. You need to do something that lowers the number of times I feel really sick. And I don't care what the PCR tells me. And you need to lower the number of times I come to the hospital. And I don't care if it's a quote unquote cardiac hospitalization or a lower leg hospitalization. I want to lower that. And when it comes to dying, I want to lower my risk of dying, not just dying of pancreas cancer. Meanwhile, increasing my risk of cardiovascular death, for instance, you know, so it's really an important point, which is that we need to think about the entity that matters to patients coming into the hospital matters, getting sick matters and dying matters, and report that endpoint purely and not, you know, what we thought the proximate cause of that endpoint was. I think that's a way. Yeah, I, I, I know. I mean, I, yes. I mean, I had a discussion with one of our pulmonologists this week, and I, I always like to, you know, always like to ask what's going on with the, what's going on with the infections. And, and he told me that the biggest thing going on now was rhinovirus infections in older people. And so rhinovirus was kicking people's butt, but he made a comment that, I, that stuck with me. And he said, you know, John, he said, if we didn't have these viral panels, we wouldn't know what virus it was. It would be just like a ILI influenza like illness, or, or it would be a viral pneumonia. And I'm, and then it made me think, I'm not sure that all of this extra diagnosis is that helpful? And and it and and again, I don't know the. I, I'm not an expert in vaccines. I'm not an ex expert in OBGYN. I'm not an expert in ICU medicine. Certainly not pediatrics. But the point is, is really we have to think about like what our endpoints are. And if our endpoints are one type of infection, and that type of infection isn't a major cause of hospitalizations, um, then. I, I I just wonder about you're, you're an expert in common sense is what you're telling me. <laughs> I mean, you're not an expert in all these things, but common sense would tell you if you give me an extra vaccine, that means in the next four seasons, I should go to the hospital less with sickness. That's what it means. Now, if you're not, and then, so look, let me wear the hat of the trialist who did this study. They're going to say, 
well, if we listen to VP and John Mandrola, we would have to run this study sample size five times as large because we won't have the power to show that. And what we would say as a counter counterbalance to that is one, well, maybe you should. I mean, we're talking about millions of people getting the shot in perpetuity. Maybe you should. And also the other possibility you're not in, considering, you know, is that one, the thing you're lowering is such a minute contributor to the problem. The other possibility is that what, what, you're not getting sick with one thing, but you might paradoxically be getting more illnesses from other things. Who knows? The only way to exclude that as a possibility, like that's definitely not happening, is to power the trial for getting sick for any reason, being hospitalized for any reason. Show me a net reduction in that. And then the final thing, the common sense point is that what does the patient care about? They do not care about what you're calling it. They care about how they feel. And you need to prove to me you improve how they feel, not what you're calling how they feel, you know, that's really kind of a semantic game. Well, you didn't even mention cost, right? I mean, yeah. if, if something isn't moving total hospitalizations and, and isn't making people less sick, but it's costing money, then, I mean, that's also, that's also an issue. We, we have this in cardiology all the time. When we, we move an endpoint, we move one type of hospitalization, but it doesn't move all cause hospitalization, but yet it costs patients Four hundred dollars per month. I mean, how is that in advance? Yeah, I think um, it's a tragedy. I mean, um, you know, uh, and 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 I like your point. I like your point that you've made many times is that these companies have the money to run these trials. I mean, money. they're 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 they they have the money to run these trials, and and we we really need a. What 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 I'm hoping to do with my writing and podcast and this podcast and sensible medicine is to sort of change the culture of sort of <clears throat> the epistemology of knowledge. I mean, how do we know what we know? And we need, you know, we need better evidence and and these companies can run these trials. It's absolutely they can run these trials. And uh, for instance, Pfizer purchased in the last few weeks CGEN, Seattle Genetics, and I believe it was something like at a high sale price, uh, what was it, $40 billion? Let's look up Pfizer CGEN purchase. Um, people who work at CGEN, $43 billion. Yeah, $229 per share, $43 billion, Pfizer acquisition price of CGEN. That is a pretty penny for Seattle Genetics. If you work for Seattle Genetics on stock, you're getting paid out handsomely. What does that tell me? Why is Pfizer buying CGEN? Their pockets are full of cash, John. They have so much cash. They don't know what to do with all their cash. Their ca their mattress is overflowing with cash. The banks, they can't put it in Silicon Valley Bank. Okay, you know, there's places you can't put the cash. So you have to buy companies. Why do they have so much cash? They have so much cash because of this FDA. This FDA. Yeah, but also, also, Vinay, these are infectious disease trials, right? I mean, they're maybe running them. I mean, they're running from six months to a year. Cardiology trials are running for three to five years. Correct. That's yes. a totally different thing, right? I mean- I mean, the, 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 the COVID vaccine trials were, were months in duration months. at most a year. So it's not, it's not even as expensive as a cardiology trial to run these trials. Not even close. And, you know, or, on, or oncology, or oncology, trials. oncology, you have to have cancer here. You just have to be pregnant. I mean, it's really, there's a lot of pregnant people. There's not a lot of cancer. You know, there's more pregnant people than there are people with, you know, hairy cell leukemia. Okay. So it's easier to run the trial. Um, yeah, they have too much money. Why do they have so much money? Because we set the bar low and cheerleaders like Eric Topol don't help. Okay, second topic, second topic. Okay. Mifepristone. When I, when I think we're gonna have a hard hitting conversation about abortion rights, I think, let me invite male cardiologist, John Mandrell. No, I just kidding, just teasing, just teasing. We, we give the disclaimer up front. Okay, two men talking about it. We're not gonna get into all the details of we're not going to solve the abortion debate in America, that's for sure. We can just talk about a couple of interesting things about the Mifepristone suit. So one thing that came out this week, two um, federal judge has issued rulings on Mifepristone, which is a synthetic steroid, which is an abortifacient, which is used for uh, an oral abortion, medical abortion. Um, and the Texas judge, perhaps most controversially, has issued a suspension of this nationally. There's a seven day period in which that can be contested. And I dug through the whole 60 page brief. And I'll be honest with you, John, half of it is legal arguments about do they have standing or like are, are the plaintiffs able to sue? I, I, I don't know anything about that. And that's beyond my expertise. 
Then he talks a few things about medicine, which is where you know you and I can come in, which is quite interesting. Um, so maybe I'll just really quickly give a summary for the listeners. Um, okay. Mifepristone originally got accelerated approval. That means that you are reasonably likely to have clinical efficacy um, in 2000. And it was for the medical termination of intrauterine pregnancy for s- in the first uh, seven weeks of pregnancy. And this was on the basis of three studies, two French, one US, where bas- they gave it to hundreds of women and they know like 92% of them, when you give them the pill, they have a medical abortion and a small fraction of them require some additional procedure like a surgical abortion in case they didn't have the proper medical abortion. Um, that was in 2000. In 2016, they tried to expand the option of this mifepristone. And so the FDA took a bunch of actions. They increased it from seven weeks to 10 weeks. They eliminated the requirement to report non-lethal safety events. They permitted people who weren't doctors to prescribe the product, maybe pharmacists or NPs. They permitted a second dose of the medication. They allowed the drug to be given outside of the doctor's office. They allowed for giving um, misopristol, the prostaglandin, sooner afterwards, which helps expel um, the uh, uh, the, the, the fetus. Um, and then they reduced the required office visits from three to one. And then a year later, they changed the REMS, which is the safety requirement reporting requirements. And then in 2021, during the COVID pandemic, they said, you know what, we can allow people to get this by mail, mail order pharmacy, um, which uh, further expands it. So basically, the plaint- so basically what this long story short is they did it, it's an uncontrolled study that shows you know women have abortions at a certain rate and there's a certain complication rate. Um, and then slowly over time, the FDA has expanded that. Now what the plaintiffs are alleging is that the FDA has violated the rules of accelerated approval because the drug had to be studied for safety and efficacy in treating a life-threatening illness. And then the judge is saying pregnancy is not a life-threatening illness. Um, the second is that they say the drug has to provide a meaningful therapeutic benefit over existing standard of care. The judge is saying that it's not better than surgical abortion. It's actually worse. So you want to, you want me to give you some thoughts on my, these things, or should we start here? Please, please, please go ahead. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. All right. So, so my first thought is the judge says that pregnancy is not an illness in and of itself. The FDA fires back and says something to the effect of, well, if you are having a child you don't want to have, you can be depressed from that. And depression is considered a serious or life-threatening illness. Um, And so ergo, we can give you this pill to prevent that downstream sequela. Uh, The judge's point is that the the thing in and of itself has to be a serious and life-threatening and not a downstream sequela. So he says by that logic, like low back pain could qualify for accelerated approval because you could have depression if you have a lot of low back pain. Um, but in my mind, it's rather difficult to separate a disease from things that happen downstream. And I do think you probably, or any condition from things that happen downstream, I think you kind of own those things. So I, I'm not really with the judge on that argument. For instance, one of the things that PSA screening does is if you tell a lot of people they have prostate cancer, some people are going to commit suicide. I mean, that's just been shown in a couple of studies. So you're going to say something like, um, well, it wasn't, it wasn't me that led him to commit suicide, you know, wasn't the prostate cancer screening test that led him to commit suicide. But, but if you didn't do it, they wouldn't, have, you know, they wouldn't have had that information. They wouldn't have killed themselves. So, you know, it, it does, uh, I think they own the downstream consequences. The yeah. Next, I mean, uh, yeah, go on. Uh, oh, go, I mean, those are great points. Uh, I think the most interesting thing for me, and, and again, we're, we're two men talking about an abortion issue, but I think that the most interesting thing, and I'd like like to get your thoughts on it is i mean here are the courts weighing in yeah okay. on, all right, all right. On, on 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 an fda decision right and so fda fda is supposed to be this this in in a perfect world they're the medical experts who have adjudicated the science and have decided to approve this drug um have even loosened approval and now we have sort of the, the judicial branch sort of weighing in on a medical topic. And I think that's a provocative thing. And you mentioned Joe Ross's point in your post and I, I'm, this is really what I want to explore, I think. Okay, is- all right, you want to get to the good stuff. All right, fine, fine. Listeners, read my post. I'll go through the, all the other details, but he, he's getting right to the heart of the matter. Okay, and I think that's the most interesting question, John. Um, who regulates the FDA? So, you know, 
Congress has written statutory language that gives the FDA wide authority to set regulatory standards for cancer drugs, cardiovascular drugs, abortion drugs, you know, devices. They have wide latitude. People like me and Joe Ross and others, Waleed Jalad, Aaron Kesselheim, for decades, we've been critical, yourself as well, of the FDA, of having just too low a bar, not enough safety standards, you know, low efficacy standards. Um, that's been a concern of the FDA. Um, the FDA says that they don't have the authority to set higher standards. I don't think that's right. I think Congress has granted them broad authority. Um, but cutting to your point. Let, let me interrupt you yes. one, one second about your FDA. It, we do think they have lower standards, but yes. there are people, smart people at the Wall Street Journal editorial board, Tyler Cowen, yeah. uh, other other people who feel differently and they think the, the bar at the FDA is actually is actually too low and they should they, they should have a lower bar. Yeah, Tyler Cowen is a smart guy. He also thinks community masking works and that uh, that basketball player Kyrie Irving should have been vaccinated or he can't play. So, I mean, I'm just saying that like it's maybe he thinks those things too. Okay, some 30 year old basketball player getting vaccinated is the, is the least of my fucking worries. Okay, it's the least of my worries, a healthy NBA athlete. Okay, anyway, but my point is this, like, you're right. Why do they think that they, why do they think what they think? They think that lower regulatory bars, increase innovation, increase products on market, the market can sort it out. Why do we think what we think? We know that the lower you put the bar, you're going to let a lot of things over the bar and maybe one in a thousand will be innovation and most will be junk. And the problem is we have no way to separate the one good thing from the junk and we pay for everything and we have a lot of problems. And so look, if, if you lowered the bar and everything was a winner, I would have no problem with lowering the bar. But if you lower the bar with the way biology is, the way the human body is, you're going to get a lot of duds. And actually I would, because, I would, I, I yeah. would add that, I would add that if you're going to lower the bar, that comes with a caveat, and I think the caveat isn't true. We're not doing what the caveat is. If you lower the bar, the caveat is most more post, um, post approval studies. And if we, if we had a lower bar and more and and more post approval studies, I think it would be probably maybe a better case scenario. But we don't have that, do we? No. And actually, that's one of the arguments in the Mifepristone case is that like the FDA made it hard, like they, they said you didn't have to report non-fatal uh, adverse events. And then they say that there are not that many non-fatal adverse events. So the plaintiffs are saying, but you study, you know, you stop collecting that, you know, you stop asking for them. And that, you know, of course, it's going to be lower. Um, but put that aside, somebody's got to regulate the FDA, John. It's either got to be one of three things. One, Congress has to regulate the FDA. To some degree, they do because they write the laws. Two, the executive, the president has to regulate the FDA because they pick the commissioner. The president picks the commissioner. Or three, the courts have to regulate the FDA. As you point out and what everyone says, the courts have never regulated the FDA like this and second-guessed the FDA. And of course, it smells really you know, fishy that the only time the courts second-guessed the FDA is on like the most controversial political issue. At the same time, somebody could argue that the FDA has never, you know, loosened requirements like this, and they're doing so under a Democratic president at a time when, you know, Roe v. Wade is in jeopardy. That's also political, one might argue. Um, I don't know the answer. I just think that, but somebody has to be able to say that the FDA is operating within their rules or going beyond. It's completely separate from abortion. I think that the bivalent booster is a violation of law, that it doesn't qualify for EUA, they gave an EUA for a six-year-old, okay? How the hell do you tell me there's a six-year-old who had three doses and COVID twice facing an emergency? So, you know, I think they're violating the law, but who do I turn to? I can't go to the Congress. I can't go to the president. I, I would have to seek remedy in the courts, although I've not been impacted personally by it. Um, so that's the question of standing, but I guess that's the question. I mean, you have to be, it's a democracy. It's a free country, a society, you know, democracy. Hum people ultimately control the FDA. But who controls the FDA? I, I don't think we can't just have an FDA that does whatever the hell they want. You know, they're accountable to somebody, the American people, either through the judges or the, you know, obviously this is an this is an example where, you know, it's kind of a yeah, but it, but I yeah. think the larger point, yeah. the, the the thing that I that stuck in my head is, you know, we 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 want the FDA, we want science adjudicators, we want New England, we want JAMA. Um, we want these. We want everybody to be like neutral adjudicators of science. We want FDA should be, but then when when you have rulings like a EUA of a bivalent booster in children, then 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 you you or 
you just worry that when there's political influence of science adjudicators, it's just problematic. And and so I'm I don't know. I don't know what to think, but I'm sympathetic to I'm sympathetic to those who, you know, look back at Jefferson and Madison and 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 look back to the founders and say that we have to have some sort of oversight of these different branches of government. And and if if the FDA is a is appointed by the executive branch then or and and controlled by the, the legislative branch, but they they are affected by politics, then I mean I don't know what to think. I mean it's it's really problematic when when political views and ideology gets involved in science adjudication, in my opinion. It's so problematic. And I think, you know, this is where I wish we had Andrew here because, um, you know, I'm somebody on the political left and I think in COVID it was the political left that actually politicized science the most. And, you know, I know many people, I know most people on the political left, they think it was Trump who did it all. Uh, we did it all on the political left. Uh, I'm on the political left, so I can say it. We did it all. We did it with the schools. We did it with the masks. We did it with this vaccine good, more vaccine better, like this Neanderthal thinking. We did it. We were the ones that did it more than the other side. We still don't recognize that. Um, you know, we think they're the ones politicizing lab leak. They might be. They might be the ones to look pursuing the truth. Okay, we might be the ones that are wrong, trying to blame it on a, a, a wet market because lab leak was racist. That, I mean, that was our starting position on the left. We said lab leak. Was, the whole idea is racist, but somehow eating animals that come from the jungle—that's not, you know, that that could have, you know, strange virus. That's not a racist. Apparently, that was not. But we thought the lab leak idea was racist. I don't know. I didn't see that. That's what Apoorva said in in her tweet. So, you know. It was politicized, I think. And, and then, of course, then they fire, and not fire, they force resignation, Gruber and Krauss, the civil servants, so that this guy who's like holding hands with Biden can make all the decisions, Peter and then Bob, and then they can decide what misinformation is and they can work with the tech companies. So, I mean, what are we talking about? Of course, it's political. So, you know, you, we need somebody to have a check on that system. Maybe the answer is we just, you know, wait for them to vote for a different president. Maybe the answer is the courts. I actually would have liked to see Mifepristone wasn't the first lawsuit that was, you know, that's gotten this kind of ruling. I would have loved to see it for a cancer drug, something where you take the politics out of it. Like, let's just pick Selinexer and then let's have somebody sue the FDA and say Boston was a delinquent negligent study, which is what I think it is. You know, that would be nice to me because then nobody would have had these political feelings and we could have asked the question, who should police the FDA? It's got to be somebody. I don't know who, but somebody's got to police them. Yeah, and I, I I think that going forward, we just we just somehow need to change the culture so that ideology and politics is 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 some is is more separated from science adjudication. And I think the pandemic, obviously, the pandemic made it worse. I mean, it was there before, but I, I'm. I don't know. I just this is the this is the tailwind that powers me to keep to keep writing and that science adjudication just needs to be more neutral. And and I hope that the pendulum will swing swing back to that. I, I don't know if it will, but but maybe it will. Yeah, I don't know if it will. I think um you know there's a really interesting op-ed about Stanford Law School um in the Washington Post today. And it was written by a student who I think you would really like. I think I would really like too. The student pointed out that there's a few kids in class who are extremely far left. There's a few kids in class who are, are far right. And uh, they were the ones who invited this recent judge. And then the ones on the far left came and heckled him and protested. And then the dean came instead of saying, okay, let him talk. The dean gave like a six minute speech about is the juice worth it? And then said, let him talk. And then, you know, people thought that that was fair. And you know, this is what happened at Stanford. My first thought on this is, I just have to say, <laughs> as somebody who was a student not long, who's got time to protest? I mean, who has got the time? I really got to say, who has got the time to protest these things? You know, these are like extra lectures at the end of the day. When I was a student, I promise you, I was not there. I have better things to do. I mean, I'd rather hang out with friends. I'd rather, you know, go to the bar, go to a club. I'd rather go to a comedy show. I just don't got the time to protest these people. That's one. Two, as a speaker, you know, I don't think I've ever gotten like a really hostile crowd, but there's sometimes I give a cancer drug talk, there's two or three people who are hostile. I don't, I don't get angry that there's a hostile person there. I kind of like it because the Q&A is more fun, you know? We get a little jousting going on. Um, 
when I get the only times I get really sad as a speaker, John, is when you go to the room and there's nobody there. And you're like, yeah. oh God, that's sad. And so I really think if you really have a speaker you don't like, just ignore them. There's nothing worse than making somebody lecture to four people from some club. You know, that is sad. But now it's like front page news and you're getting all this attention. He's writing like all these op ed I mean, it's just not effective. It's just, it's just a waste of everyone's time. Okay. But the student wrote the thing I was going to tell you the student wrote this op ed. And she says, um, there are few left, few right, and most people just are in the middle. Mo like what you're saying, John, most people just in the middle, but they just, just, they're just quiet because they're like, you know, if they say one thing one way, this person's going to attack them. Other thing, this person's going to attack them. Most people just in the middle. And, uh, and I hope the middle people win. I mean, I really do hope the middle wins on this. Yeah, I think that's what our goal is. Sensible medicine, that's what our goal is in our sub stacks. And the fact that many of these independent journalists are making um are you know making progress in in independent journalism and independent voices i i'm i'm cautiously optimistic that the 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 center the center will hold and i just wish some politician and leader would get up there and represent the center and and you know be more like denmark like look you know, here, here's what we know and here's what we don't know and here's what we think is best. And, and, and guess what, if the evidence changes, we'll change. And this, this is, this is my um, goal and I'm probably hopelessly naive. Well, maybe we'll build our own movement. But the last thing I say about the judge is, you know, like when I read it as a doctor, I just think that the, the difference between doctor and law brain is so far because there are like so many parts in the judge's ruling where they're like, you know, 500 women had complications. And I was like, but what's the denominator? <laughs> like how many people took the pill, right? And then I'm like looking all over for it. I can't find, and I'm like, okay, Dr. Brain, first question I have is, don't just give me a numerator, give me the denominator, right? And you know, in cancer, we're like 400 people did well with sequencing. Okay, but how many you sequence? 400,000, 400,000, what the hell? You know, okay, so that's number one. Two, like, I feel like the judge never asks the question, you know, it's like, is the abortion pill better than this or that or whatever? But I was like, but is it the alternative to not having the pill is a mix, I think, of lots of unwanted babies. And then a lot of people getting like back alley abortions. Isn't that like, like and what's the side effect of that? Like, that doesn't sound, sound good. So like, where's that thinking? So this whole, like the doctor brain of thinking about counterfactuals, the judges, they don't got that, I don't think. Yeah, but you're, you're I'm not sure you, you, you have a doctor's brain, but I'm not sure <laughs> I'm not sure that it's representative sample of, of all these doctors. And it's a good segue into what I want to ask you okay, about at the end. Right. But, but, you know, Vinay, you're thinking about counterfactuals, right? But, 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 but part of causal inference is thinking about counterfactuals, but, but, but when, 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 during the pandemic and it's not just the pandemic and cardiology, you know, we, we've got a, we've got a lesion of 90% blockage. So we're going to fix it. And we're not thinking about, one year later when that patient has to have back surgery and come off their, come mm. off their antiplatelet drugs. Right. And so, you know, you think about counterfactuals and I think about counterfactuals because I'm old and I've seen counterfactuals, but I'm not sure that a lot of doctors are thinking these things. Well, maybe they'll learn that from our show as well. And that's the third topic. Let's go to the third topic. And, and I want to yeah. spend five to 10 minutes and I want to ask you, I want to ask you, so I've been given this, I've been given this assignment to talk about medical necessity versus therapeutic fashion, meaning what we do in medicine that's absolutely necessary and true and, and clear and what we adopt uh, because everybody else is adopting it. And I, I really, I know it's a broad topic, but one of the things that, one of the things that interests me from the history standpoint is, you know, we treated people after heart attacks with because they had PVCs, these premature beats, and and if you went against that, you were you were you were a nut job. But then it turned out that that was actually killing people. When I was in my clinic in Indianapolis back in the 1990s, we gave hormone replacement therapy to women because we said this will help their cardiovascular health, and that turned out to be absolutely terrible. We made people worse, and there you know. We use these Swan Gans catheters, and and there's so many things that you've written. You and Adam have written about. Hey, did but, you do some good things too, John? Or is it only? <laughs> yes, but yes, of course we do good things. <laughs> yeah, but today, today, yeah. 2023, we do stuff 
we do stuff that I'm not sure will stand up uh, to like the history 10 years, 20 years on. Like I'm pretty sure that when we ablate somebody's accessory pathway and we cure them of uh, WPW, WPW, that's going to stand up well. WPW. Um, but some of these other things that I do, like AFib ablation and, and my partners who are my colleagues who are doing, you know, uh, techniques to prevent stroke. And I'm not sure the, how well these are going to stand up. But my question to you is, what are the factors that lead doctors to accept these fashionable things without evidentiary standard? Okay. So it's a great question. So the talk is therapeutic necessity or fashionable practice. What is it called? Fashionable? Uh, medical necessity versus medical necessity. therapeutic fashion. And therapeutic I've, fashion. I'm, I've sort of, I've sort of started this, I've sort of used this therapeutic fashion, meaning that Things get going, and 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 you can't you can't go against it. Uh, fixing coronary lesions, doing stress tests for chest pain, coronary artery calcium screening. I mean, in your world, uh, mammography, uh, PSA screening, um, and I'm sure there's chemotherapy yeah. things that are that are fashionable that have pretty lousy evidentiary standard. Yeah, so that's a great question. Okay, so here's how I would think about it. I would say like. Whatever we're doing right now happens to be the therapeutic fashion of 2023. So I might think therapeutic fashion is just everything we're doing right now. What's what's in fashion in vogue these days? You know, I always joke with the fellows. Um, when I was a trainee, we barely said HLH. Now every week, HLH, HLH, hemophagocytic lymphocytosis, a very uh, frequently- Wait, what is that? <laughs> what is that? What is that? It is, um, what's the, the textbook answer or my cynical answer? Um, what is it? It is a condition that often affects people with, well, it was originally something well characterized in the pediatric literature where it has a genomic polymorphism that's tightly linked. That's primary HLH, hemophagocytic lymphocytosis, where you have hemo, you have uh, phagocytosis of like early RBC precursors in, in the marrow. So that's what it is in kids. In adults, you kind of see people who are sick with all sorts of things from cancer to HIV to just really sick, having some of these characteristics that we had seen in kids and so people have created these sort of scoring systems. Uh, I won't bore the listener. Um, let's just say it was a diagnosis that wasn't that popular 20 years ago. Now everyone just keeps saying all the time. And, you know, to me, it's like the weakest diagnosis. There's like no randomized studies in the field. It's just always talked about. So that's in therapeutic fashion now. Hit heparin-induced thrombocytopenia thrombosis. Therapeutic fashion 2023. When I was a student in 2005, we didn't say hit as often. I mean, hit was less common. Um, lots of things are in therapeutic fashion. Of all the things in therapeutic fashion, only a tiny fraction, I think, is medically necessary, are things that really have well done randomized control trials showing benefit and benefits so big that most Americans would say it's worth it to me. Because also like a small benefit with real soft toxicity, that's not medically necessary because a lot of people will say, eh, I'd skip it. You know, it's like preference. That's preference sensitive. But I think very few people who have crushing substernal chest pain would say, you know, very few people with crushing substernal chest pain and ST elevation would say, you know what, just let let that cook, let that meat, let that heart cook. I'm going to say, Doc, you know, John, go in there and put that guide wire over that lesion and stent me open, you know? Okay, so that's medically necessary, stenting, STEMI. Um, very few things are medically necessary, I think. The paucity, maybe 5%, but, but 10%. How can yeah. But that's so interesting, right? Because what you're talking about is when a when a heart attack occurs, the blood vessel is totally blocked, usually with blood clot. Uh, a doctor, I mean, cardiology has been transformed by the fact that cardiologists can go in in under 90 minutes and open that blockage. And we basically, we've made, heart, we've, we've decreased the amount of heart failure due to this uh, heart damage so much that we, we do... I do so few defibrillators. I mean, we've transformed that. But the same procedure, yes. the same procedure, yes. the coronary stent done in a blockage that's 80% and it may or may not be causing chest pain. When, when this is studied, when this is studied systematically, we can't show, we can't show benefit over simply taking a statin and some aspirin. And, and why is it why is it i'm trying I'm, i rack my brains that we can't doctors can't see the difference why is this so fashionable to say that blockage is so scary and we have to fix it but yet in the face of multiple randomized controlled trials showing that it doesn't really lead to any benefit 
I think it goes back to what we said last week, anecdote, arrogance, ignorance, anxiety, apathy, innovators, those kind of things. Like, you know, every new generation comes along ignorant of history. They don't know the CAST trial and women's health initiative, the things that you talked about, those reversals. Um, so they all want to reinvent the wheel. Every new generation comes. They want to be an innovator. I want to make something new. I want to make a name for myself. We all come in. You know, when you stent somebody with chronic stable angina, the patient says, I feel good, and you get reimbursed. That's like the methamphetamine of being a doctor. It's a powerfully addictive substance, like positive reinforcement and a little bit of financial reward. Um, it is interesting to me, John. Like, uh, I mean, I mean, but but if but if, but but what I'm saying is is that if this was if there wasn't this history, if a neutral Martian just came down and 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 or an outside observer just came and they looked at the courage trial, Barry 2D, ischemia trial, um, they would look at this and, and it would just be crystal clear. But yet, but yet, even me, even me, I go into the cath lab and I I, I watch, you know, I because I'm I'm a, I'm I'm a voyeur. I'm a journalist. When I go into the cath lab, I'm like, "What are you all doing?" And they'll they'll shoot an angiogram, and there'll be a terrible lesion. I'm like, "Oh crap! I wouldn't want that." And and it's like it it's 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 like baked in to our to our being. And I don't even think there's anything nefarious about it. But I I don't know I I don't know how these 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 fashionable things get baked in. And I'm sure you have them in oncology. Of course. And, you know, there's that Osler quote, the desire to take medicine is what separates man from the animals. So like, you're right. Like we do desire, like, I want you to make me better. You know, if I, if you cap me and I have an 80%, you know, lesion, asymptomatic, you know, I'll be like, uh, you know, do I really want to change my diet, <laughs> you know, like dramatically to kind of, you know, like, like that Ornish diet to, to try to get that to go away. No, I, I don't know about that. Um, it's hard, John. I mean, it's really so hard. part of me, part of me, I let, we need to close, but philosophically, part of me really thinks that one of the ways to, one of the ways to get over this, and, and it's, I, I, I hope that listeners don't think it's nihilism, but one of the ways is only know these things when it's, there's evidence of knowing that it makes a difference, right? So for me personally, of course, I don't want to die. Um, and, but I don't want to know that I have an 80% uh, coronary lesion because I don't want the I don't want the conflict of no knowing what to do. So uh, I'm only going to get um, investigated if I have symptoms. I mean, I'm not into this prevention because I'm just not sure knowing uh, uh, makes a difference. And that's why I'm so skeptical of coronary artery calcium and vascular screening and 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 your world, you know, cancer screening. It's just to me, if there's evidence that screening, helps us, I'm for it. But you have to show me compelling evidence. It's such a really good point. And in this way, this is the difference between the tech bro that's really smart and the cardiologist that's really smart. Because the tech bro that's really smart wants to wear a watch that checks his blood pressure all the time and make sure he's not an AFib and swab himself and does all this like, what did Mark Cuban call it? Baseline blood work. But the cardiologist that's really smart knows Never check my PSA. I don't want you to check it. Never check my APOE status. I don't want to know. Um, you know, you're not going to like yeah, this, but I, I, I haven't checked my lipids. I don't want to know. What do I care? I'm 40. The minute, the minute these things, the minute these things show me in a randomized control, if the coronary yes. artery calcium screeners, if if they showed me that there was a five percent reduction in my in my chance of uh, uh, reducing mortality, I'd I'd consider it. Um, but until that's done, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about the counterfactuals. So well put. I mean, you know, I'm a skeptic and I lost all the video card, one video card blue. Um, yeah, I think the point is two things. One, don't get tests unless you know what to do, you know, unless you've proven that getting that information is useful. And two, if you want people to get tests, prove that it's useful. It has a net benefit right. in aggregate. They don't, they don't want to do that because it harms innovation. The same reason they don't want to do an RSV vaccine in pregnant women that measures all hospitalizations as the endpoint. And the same reason they don't want to do a booster vaccine RCT that measures hospitalization or death is the same reason why they don't want to prove that, you know, the blood-based screening tests improve all-cause mortality because they'd rather just bring it to market. Yeah, I think that's the crux of it. 
Exactly. Right. So it's going to be a great talk in Portugal. All right. All right. Great talk. Thank you. Great talk. And uh, you'll be in Portugal. I will. Next week, I'm out. Okay. And, uh, you know, I was also invited to go back to Copenhagen. <laughs> I might go. I might go back in the fall. I love that city. Yes. Love that lucky. city. It's funny. Look at us. We're, we're, we spend more time in Europe. Oh, uh, I don't know John. about that, but it is a, it is an, it is an enchanting place to visit. And of course, Europeans love to come to the U.S. Do you have four minutes? I want to do one more thing. Yeah. Four minutes. Okay. No, oh. I got all the time in the world. Okay. Okay. Here's what I want to do because Sifu didn't want, Sifu is a, you know, he's a long COVID apologist. There is that very good paper. There's that very good paper from Norway, Dr. John, that I don't think got nearly enough attention. And it took these young adult adolescents, you know, I forget the, I think it was maybe 12 through 25 ish kind of age range. And they took these kids who came in to get a PCR test for COVID-19 and they separate them into those that had COVID-19 and those that didn't have COVID-19, but they still got the test. And then they follow a subgroup out and they give them all these questionnaires to look for long COVID, that constellation of brain fog and fatigue and all those things. And then they power the study for a relative risk of 1.5, meaning if you've had COVID, you are 1.5 times more likely to have the long COVID syndrome than if you haven't had COVID. And they find there's no link between having COVID and having the syndrome. In fact, only loneliness and, uh, and how severe your initial symptom was predicts how, uh, whether or not you have the long COVID syndrome of fatigue, brain fog, all those things. And this has been debated so much. People say, oh, you know, the study didn't have enough power. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You're not supposed to have long COVID if you didn't have COVID. Like it's supposed to not exist if you didn't have COVID, right? COVID is supposed to be the thing that caused it. And I think what it also reveals is half of all the kids had the symptoms, meaning that like kids are not doing well right now, but it just has nothing to do with whether or not they had COVID. This was a JAMA Network open paper. Um, and I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, you know, my thoughts on this are that before the pandemic, you and I and many people, Harlan Crumholz from Yale, Many of these, many people, we, 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 I think some of us went to the Lowen Institute meetings. And what was the topic? Overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And so whenever I think about these, whenever I think about long COVID and, and post COVID syndromes, I think, are we overdiagnosing people? And, and of course, the problem, look, the problem is that, you know, you don't want to minimize people who feel badly. That's not what, that's not what I'm advocating for. And I would never, never want to do that. But we were worried pre pandemic about overdiagnosis. We were worried about medicalization. And now why, why do we, why do we not have this worry about this, this ill-defined condition? Um, and, and I think the, 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 to me, the, the more empirically sound the study, the, you know, the more, the more dubious this this looks. So I'm worried about overdiagnosis. I'm worried about medicalization. The same in 2023 that I was in 2019. Yeah, I'm the same. And you know, people suffer from all sorts of reasons. No one is downplaying that. But if you if you say the reason you're suffering is because last Tuesday you ate a hot dog, and that's not the reason you're suffering, you know, it's not helping anybody to attribute it to the wrong thing. And this study really shows relative risk 1.06. And I'm sorry, the people who think the study is underpowered, the relative risk should have come at 40 or 30. I mean, COVID should be causing the syndrome. If it's happening in near identical numbers in people who didn't have COVID, you have a problem with the definition, the diagnostic studies, you have a big problem, or the pathophysiology, you have a problem, a real problem. And anyway, good study. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I just think that, I just think that we 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 need to have the counterfactuals in mind always. You know the 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 problem with the problem with overdiagnosis and medicalization is huge, and and we we need to we need to keep that in mind. And um, I, I, nothing's changed from pre-pandemic for me. And that'll be the last word. Counterfactuals in mind. He's not qualified to be a federal judge because he knows about counterfactuals. John Mandrola, <laughs> enjoy Europe. We'll be back. Next week, Sensible Medicine. I don't know who's coming. 
maybe. And then John will be back the week after. Thanks for doing it. All right, man. Thanks.